Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. We're dealing with some very crucial issues as we are going through this passage because this introduces us to the theme of rebellion and what God does about it. It's very important because God has ordained four spheres or areas of authority. And within those areas of authority, he has uh, ordained certain leadership and has given instructions concerning obedience to that leadership. Now, last week we added to what I had previously said about rebellion against God's ordained leadership, and I expanded on that principle. We asked the question, why is rebellion against God's ordained leadership direct rebellion against God? And we saw that there were at least four reasons. Number one, God always provides leadership in every sphere of authority which he has ordained. So it came from God. Leadership is necessary for those under authority for their protection, for their direction, for their discipline, and a host of other reasons. And that we saw was supported by multiple different uh, passages of scripture. We saw the four different categories. The home, where we saw two categories, and saw a dual level of authority, where the children and wives are uh, under the obedience of the husband, uh, and the wives obey the husband, but the children also obey the wives. And we saw Ephesians 6, Ephesians, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3 again, uh, to support those teachings. Then we looked at the church. We looked at leadership in the church, which includes the pastor, the elders, and the deacons. The Bible doesn't talk about trustees, but it does talk about pastors, elders, and deacons. And we looked at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17, and saw that the Bible puts pastors in a parallel with the role of a father ruling a household and children where obedience is required. And we noted that if the requirements for the pastoral office are absolute, and they are, then the requirements of obedience by the flock is also absolute, provided that the pastor does not instruct you or require the violation of either a command or a prohibition of the Bible. We saw that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And we saw that parallel in verses 4 and 5, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? In addition, pastors also have the authority we saw to stop troublemakers, critics, and false teachers. That's clear from Titus chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers, for there are many unruly and vain talkers, whose mouths must be stopped, wherefore rebuke them sharply. Taking the phrases out of each of those verses. We saw that the third sphere of authority is the government. And that is an absolute command to obey the government unless the government requires you to disobey a command or prohibition given by God, who is the higher authority. Some of the, us do that on a regular basis because we speed. Did you know the government has the absolute right to set the speed limit, whether you like it or not? I'm giving that just as a simple example because I think everybody identifies with that. And I think we probably all of us, if we drive at least, have broken the speed limit at some point or another and probably have done it deliberately because we thought, I got to get to work on time or that's really a stupid speed limit to have, a 25 mile an hour speed limit and the road is a six lane highway. Did you know? The government can tell you to drive five miles an hour on the interstate if it wants to and God expects you to obey it. Because in the sphere of civil authority and criminal authority, God has given the government absolute authority unless they command you and tell you, all right, all of you uh, women out there have to become prostitutes. Or they say, all of you men out there have to come and offer a sacrifice to the president who now has taken the role of God. That kind of thing. Otherwise, all civil and criminal authority belongs to government. And Paul makes a big, long passage about that in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. 
Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power. And the word is exousia, it's not dunamis. It's exousia, it's the word for authority. But of God, the powers that be, that is the authorities that be, whatever you see out there, are ordained of God. What happens to you if you say, but I don't believe that. I think, you know, I think they're from the devil. I <laughs> look at those guys and I think, yeah, but they're pagans. They curse and swear and they run around and, you know, they cheat on their wives and they do this and that and the other thing. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We're talking absolute authority. In every sphere where God ordains authority, it's absolute authority unless the authority commands you to disobey the word of God. Unless the authority commands you to rebel against either a command or a prohibition that God has given. Or to violate a principle that God has clearly laid down in scripture. We like to fudge the edges and say, well, yeah, but it doesn't really mean in everything, right? I mean, like, I can really go 25 miles an hour in a five mile an hour zone, even if it's an interstate highway. I might even punch through the floor if I've got a, a radar detector and I know there are no cops in the area. Folks. God is absolute. He's dealing with a sinful world. He has ordained authority in four spheres of authority. He has given us direct, clear instructions concerning obedience. When we disobey what God has ordained, we are disobeying God. Say, but what do you got a government like, like Hitler's? Well, Hitler's government told you to turn in Jews and kill them. That's contrary to scripture. What if we got a government like China? China's government bulldozes churches and kills Christians for worshiping. But you've been commanded on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him. The story's got us prospering. There'll be no gathering when they come. You, you're supposed to be, not only gather, but you're supposed to give on the first day of the week. The book of Hebrews says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, all the, the bad governments, and there are plenty of them out there, which tell you you can't do this or can't do that, do things or command things that are in direct contradiction to the word of God. But are you supposed to obey the speed limit in China? Yes. Because God has ordained the government in all the civil and criminal affairs that do not contradict the scripture. We as Christians, because we live in America, where we are free thinkers and where, you know, we have rights, think that we can get away with disobedience. God says rebellion is sin. It stems from Satan in Isaiah chapter 14 where Satan rebelled against God with his five great I wills and God cast him from heaven. And so we have government. Then we have work. There's an absolute command that unless the boss requires you to violate a command or a prohibition required by God, you have to obey the command. Suppose you've been hired as an executive assistant to the boss. You think, man, it's pretty good. I get to sit in the office right outside the boss's office. I answer the phone, you know, and do this stuff. And the boss says to you, so-and-so, Come in here for a minute. You come in and you say, now look, this floor is really a mess. I want you to get down on your hands and knees and by hand pick up every little, you know, I've been punching paper in those little round dots, you know, that come out of punching paper. They're all over the floor. I want you to pick up paper off the floor and you, you boil inside because you think this is not what an executive assistant does. You know what? He has the right to tell you to pick up the little pieces of paper on the floor. But there are things he doesn't have the right to tell you to do. I have a relative who, maybe 35 years ago, uh, was working for an employer. It was a female relative. And she was working as an executive assistant. And the boss said to her, uh, said, uh, listen, I'm going to be in the office all day long today. But anybody who calls, tell them that I am on a long trip and I can't be reached by phone. She said, but sir, that would 
be requiring me to tell a lie. He says, it's a white lie. It's no big deal. I just want to be left alone. She says, can't I just tell them that you're not available today and that you want to be left alone? He says, no, I want you to tell them that I'm on a big, long business trip and I'm not available by phone on the big, long business trip. She says, I can't do that. He fired her. See, because he required her to lie. If somebody requires you to lie or the boss requires you to do something immoral, for example, so that you can get a promotion, you say no. He says, I'll fire you. You say, I still can't do it because I have a higher authority. Only when you are commanded to do something that is prohibited by the Bible or you are prohibited from doing something that is commanded by the Bible can you say, I must obey the higher authority? That's not a point of rebellion. That's a point of obedience to the higher authority in each of the different spheres of authority which God has ordained. And we saw passages both in Ephesians and Colossians uh, dealing with those issues. The second reason we saw why rebellion against God's divine uh, ordained leadership is rebellion against God is because God forbids rebellion to the divine ordained authority in the Bible. In other words, you've got specific biblical commands. The Bible commands that intermediate authority, that is divine leaders who have been appointed by God, he's the ultimate authority, these are all intermediate authorities, must be obeyed unless the leadership gives those commands that require you to disobey the Bible. The third reason why rebellion against God ordained leadership is rebellion against God is this, rebellion against authority is an accusation against God that he was stupid and didn't know what he was doing or that what was, uh, or what was best when he qualified and placed the leaders in authority. Fourth reason that we studied was the the rebellion against God's ordained authority or leadership is rebellion against God because rebellion against authority is an attempt to establish your own personal authority which stems from pride. Then we moved out of rebellion theory and we began to make application. And this is where we ended last week. We saw, you know, you know how, you, how it works. Uh, what is the minimum I must do and still be in compliance with the letter of the law. We always don't know what the letter of the law is, so we don't have to do anything outside of the letter of the law. That's one of the things that makes you a legalist, by the way. People call you a legalist if you stand for righteousness, when they themselves may be the actual legalists. We've talked about legalism and the four different types of legalism that there are. Uh, that are listed for us in scripture. We'll not talk about that today. But most people want to uh, do the bare minimum and still be in compliance with the letter of the law. So they're always looking for loopholes. They're always looking for more pleasing options than what they seem to see. And I gave you last week the illustration from the life of Christ. When a lawyer, somebody who is very focused on details if he wants to win his cases, when a lawyer challenged him regarding eternal life and Jesus responded with the parable of the Good Samaritan. In that parable, when the lawyer asked the question, and who is my neighbor, the lawyer wanted to limit the pool of beneficiaries to whom he was obligated by requiring a detailed analysis of that question, and who is my neighbor? Come on, Jesus, list my neighbors for me so that I don't have any obligations to anybody else. I don't want to have a bunch of beneficiaries that I'm giving stuff to and, and I don't really have to do it. And of course, Jesus didn't limit the pool of beneficiaries. Jesus expanded the pool to include people whom the lawyer despised and hated, the Samaritan. That brings us to today. Remember, we're studying the rebellion of the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings. Now, application of the principle of rebellion theory and the biblical response. So, we've already dealt with the theory, the rebellion theory. Now, what's the biblical response? Application of the principle of rebellion theory and biblical response goes even further. The question concerning what is my specific obligation or I don't want to do more than I have to has an even deeper level of analysis to make sure that we are not in rebellion. And it deals with the issue of what if there are multiple leaders, like in the home. There's dad and mom in the home. They're, they're the leaders of the home and all the kids are, you know, subordinate to that. I'll give that as an example. In a family, the kids often want to automatically side with mom because they just sort of gut feeling intrinsically know that she's right. 
You see, they spend a lot more time with mom than with dad because he's away at work most of the day. So the kids learn to trust mom. She feeds them. She kisses their ouchies, their skinned knees. She reads them stories. She plays with them all day long. She's not usually as demanding as dad is. But, but what if there's a disagreement between mom and dad? What if mom says, here's an illustration. What if mom says, we need to borrow money for a bigger car because the kids are just packed in like sardines. And the kids will definitely agree. Yeah, I have to sit next to Johnny and he's always hogging the space. <laughs> oh boy, I've heard that so many times, except with the names of my kids. Or when I was a kid, with the names of my brother and sister. The kids will definitely agree. Yeah, I have to sit next to Johnny and he's always hogging the space. And so Johnny responds, yeah, let's borrow the money and get the car now because Mary's always poking me with her elbow. And so dad says, no, we're saving money to buy a minivan and it will only take a few more months. You see, I want to pay cash for the minivan and not pay all that extra financing rate. So then the whining begins. And mom, with support from the kids, starts to pout and make life hard for dad. And they talk about how selfish dad is because he has a big driver's seat all to himself. One of those captain chair kind of seats. And they all got to squeeze together on a bench seat. In other words, that raises the question, what if there are multiple leaders in one of the divinely ordained spheres of authority? People who ask this question usually have a situation where they have one leader that they don't like and would rather support a different leader. So, what if there are multiple leaders? You see, that's also an important question that the Bible answers clearly. More precisely, what if there are multiple leaders and what if there is a disagreement among the leaders? Who do you follow? The answer, in short, is that God never ordains a dual role leadership without giving one of the leaders the final authority. And God always appoints one of the leaders as the principal leader. If the question arises, sometimes it doesn't arise, but if it does, for example, I think that's obvious as in the family example that I just gave. Although the wife has intermediate authority over the children, she is, whether wives you like it or not, subordinate to her husband. God made it that way. If you have a complaint, your complaint is against God, you fall into the category of the children of Israel in the wilderness. She is the subordinate authority, and the husband has the final authority in family matters. Now, just because you have authority in one sphere of authority does not mean that you have authority in different spheres. The husband may be the authority in his home, but he may be the janitor at work, at the very bottom of the totem pole. In different spheres of authority, you can have different levels of authority. Many wives don't get it because, and you can tell this easily, you see them all the time, you know some of them, because they whine, they pout, they fuss, they rebel, they scheme, and they manipulate to get their own way. Say manipulate, what do you mean? Well, manipulation takes many, many different forms. Let me just give you about 10 of them. <laughs> Hope I don't give you any ideas if you haven't thought of these yourself. But <laughs> anyway, at least just 10 different ways uh, that it happens. And then I'll suggest a few others as well. But for example, deliberately squandering money that the husband has worked hard for so that he doesn't have it to, for the things he wanted to do. I know one couple that I counseled for years where this was a problem. The wife would take the husband's paycheck and she knew that he wanted to get certain things and that he was working towards certain goals and when he'd almost reached the goal, she'd take the money and spend it and then grin because he couldn't do what he wanted to do. Their wives would manipulate that way. Other wives pretend to have health issues to make themselves the center of attention. Oh man, I know some like that that are just bonkers. Perfectly fine when they're around their friends, but boy, when they're with their husbands, oh, they're always sick. Man, they can't take it. You know, don't put pressure on me, that kind of stuff. Or how about throwing physical assets away that the wife knows the husband wants to keep? They pretend to be the cleany-cleany types, 
But they know that the husband has set aside his fishing gear because in the spring he wants to go fishing. And so they decide to go on a rampage and clean out the closet and they throw away his fishing pole and all of his fishing tackle and his waiter boots and his hat. And he comes home and says, well, I was just cleaning out the closet and those things, I mean, the kids might get stuck on the hooks and, you know, use all kinds of idiot excuses. How about screaming and yelling and trying to manipulate him by brute force? Boy, I know some women like that. Some women who are actually physically bigger than their husbands and they actually beat up on their husbands. I've had to deal with some situations like that too. How about throwing things at him and then telling him that you'll call the police if he tries to physically stop you? I know a situation like that. How about giving him the silent treatment? There are some women like that. They give him the silent treatment. They give him a stone face. They scowl. They stomp out of the room with their arms closed. They won't talk to him for two or three days. That's called manipulation. Here's one that is very popular among women, Christian women as well as secular women, withholding sex. In the marital relationship, Paul says, you are not to do that unless it is for an agreed on period of time that is short enough where you could fast the entire period of time and then come together again that you not be tempted for your incontinency. And that's the responsibility of both husband and wife, neither one, to withhold that within the context of the marital relationship. A lot of wives and some husbands do that as well. How about manipulating him by gossiping to get other people, not just the children, on her side? Well, I know some women like that. Their mouths are like machines. And they tell everybody everything that's going on inside their household, and they do it with such a slant that everybody says, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right, yeah, you're right. And she bad mouths her husband and drives him into the ground in the minds and the eyes of everybody else. How about encouraging rebellion in the children against their father's authority, like giving them contrary commands? How about, oh, this one happens a lot, acting sweet to catch him off guard and then doing something to provoke him? You know, there are a lot of other, what we would call more creative forms of rebellion like wearing loud clothes to embarrass him or clothes that you know he hates or wearing immodest clothes that attract the attention of other men. You know, listen folks, over the last 4,000 years, uh, 6,000 years since the days of Eve, but certainly since the days of Abraham, women have tried to manipulate their husbands. We see Sarah doing it. We see Eve doing it. You read the Old Testament, you see women all over the place doing it. Even Jezebel manipulating Ahab to kill a righteous man. The creative forms of rebellion. The list goes on and on, and you know that I speak the truth because you've done it. Ladies, understand, God will judge you for that. So understand it clearly and get your act together now. Okay, you say, well, we got the family laid down and all the men are saying, amen, brother, preach it, preach it, preach it, bro. No, to me some reject. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Just remember that to balance that, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. Do you love your wife as much as and in the same manner as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? If not, you better get on the stick and do it because you'll be held accountable for that. Okay, so what about the other three spheres of a divinely ordained authority? So let's look at some examples in the Bible. In a different realm of authority, we find an illustration in the life of Moses with Miriam, Moses' older sister, and Aaron, Moses' older brother. They both decided to co-opt or preempt Moses' leadership. They had at least five reasons, which they thought were great reasons, five reasons 
for saying we can co-opt or we can preempt Moses' leadership. Now, I hope you're taking notes because at some point you'll be tempted to use these reasons to co-opt or preempt leadership, and you've got to resist them. So, what are the reasons? After all, here are the reasons that they had for trying to preempt or co-opt Moses' leadership. Number one, I'll read you the passage in just a second. Number one, Moses had done something that they thought was stupid and culturally unacceptable. So you have a leader, he does something that you think is stupid. He does something that you think is culturally unacceptable. Not unacceptable in the eyes of God, but culturally unacceptable. Here are the reasons, number one. Number two, they outnumbered him two to one. I often have been in a situation where you thought, well, I got the majority on my side. After all, we live in a democracy and everything's up for a vote. Not everything. But they outnumbered him. Number three, they were older than he was. Hmm, that's used often. Number four, and here's the pious one. They'd been around serving the Lord longer than he had. I mean, God didn't call him until he was in the middle of the desert. He was 80 years old, but they'd been serving the Lord all of that time. And fifth, oh, I can hear it now. Now, now listen, Moses, while you were living in the luxury of Pharaoh's palace for 40 years, and while you were fooling around the desert for 40 years, we were suffering under the oppression of Pharaoh. After all, fair is fair. We ought to have some say in the matters as well as our kid brother. Say, what are you talking about? Where, where's a passage like that? Okay. Well, first, let me point out that not only are those reasons full of logical fallacy because they omit key premises, but thinking that way is also stupid reasoning and misses the point entirely. What is the real issue? What is the point? Number one, a question, who ordained the different levels of authority? Who ordained the authority that is? Number two, who has the ultimate authority placed in the position of principal authority under him? Phrasing it that way gives us clarity to the principle. So let me tie it to Moses and to our text. Here's Moses and his siblings. They're, they're the example. This is from Numbers chapter 12. If you turn over there, you'll be able to read it along with me. I'm not making this up. Numbers chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. So here's Moses doing something they thought was stupid and culturally unacceptable. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Moses! You are so stupid. That is so culturally unacceptable. That was their first point of contention. And they said, hmm, we outnumber him. Verse 2. They said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? He's just one. Hath he not spoken also by us? We're two. We outnumber him. But then we hear something else. And the Lord heard it. Do you know that God hears every word that you speak. And Jesus himself said, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Folks, that makes me sweat and tremble. 
Because I know that as I was growing up, I said all kinds of idle words. I try not to do it now, but I still do it. I'm going to have to give account for those, and so are you. The Lord heard it. Now we have a description of the character of Moses. It uses the word meek. Meek does not mean weak. Meekness is power under control. Write that down. Remember it. Meekness is power under control. We call it self-control. It says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses is sitting and listening to his brother and sister, his big brother and his big sister, badmouth him. He hasn't said anything. They're criticizing the woman he married, the woman he loved. They're using that as the weapon by which they say, we are going to take over. Look at verse 4. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. God says, I'm going to make this public. And I'm going to give an example. Because I don't want to happen again. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle. Do you get it? Where does that cloud usually rest? It usually rests on the back end of the tabernacle. It usually rests over the area called the Holy of Holies. He usually rests over the mercy seat where the blood is sprinkled once a year on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. But the cloud comes down and it stands in the door of the tabernacle. God's coming closer. God's coming closer. God's coming closer. No longer above the tent. He is standing in the door of the tabernacle. Who is it that's standing there and speaking? It's the pre-incarnate Christ. It's Jesus. He's the resident of the Shekinah. Jesus says, I've heard your rebellion. You three come up here. I can remember as a child I sit in the back row of the church, had a couple of my friends with me, probably eight or nine, ten years old. We were joking around and kidding and talking and laughing. My father stopped preaching. He said, Christian, and he named the other two or three boys, you guys come down here to the front. The whole congregation was watching. He made us get out of our seats and sheepishly walk down the aisle to the front of the auditorium. And he came down out of the pulpit and stood in front of us and said to us, Do you understand that we are here to worship the holy God of heaven? And you are destroying the worship of the holy God of heaven? I wanted to collapse in a puddle on the floor. I felt so embarrassed. But I felt more afraid, not merely because that was my dad and I knew I'd get a licking when I got home, because I always got a licking whenever he was disciplining me. But I had a fear of God. Jesus in the Shekinah comes to the door of the tabernacle. 
and called Aaron and Miriam, and they came both forth. The three come out, but now he calls those two forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? You think God had ordained leadership? They had a secondary role in leadership. I mean, Aaron was going to be the great high priest, you know, for, you know, the father of all the ironic priesthood. Miriam was the woman who led the timbrels and dances and songs at the edge of the Red Sea. And all the women followed her, and that was perfectly okay. They thought they were big cheese. But God had chosen one to be at the head. And Moses says, Don't you realize, or God says to Miriam and Aaron, Don't you realize? That I chose Moses. Remember, I said, yeah, but, but God, Moses wouldn't even exist if I hadn't been down there by the riverside, you know. I mean, I was a big girl, and, and he was floating around like a little baby in that basket out there, and, you know, I was keeping the crocodiles away. And That's irrelevant. God uses human agents, but God is the one who kept the crocodiles away. God is the one who gave Pharaoh's daughter an itch where she wanted to take a bath and she went down to the exact spot in the river where Moses was and found him and God moved her heart. Dear people, I'm not significant or important and you are not significant or important. We are servants of the living God. And what he commands is what we must do. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed, and the cloud departed from all the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not thy the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly and wherein we have sinned. He is the high priest. He's making intercession. His own sister stands there speechless. She doesn't say, oh, I've sinned. I had a bad mouth. But Aaron intervenes. We've sinned. You know, when God has mercy, it's because his people, instead of arguing with him, say, we have sinned. When David committed adultery with Bathsheba, and Bathsheba was pregnant with a child, and David found that out, she told him, and he sent to Joab, and he said, look, in your battle against this city, put Uriah the Hittite in the front line of the battle so that he'll get killed. He tried first to get Uriah to come home and sleep with his wife so Uriah would think it was his kid. But that didn't work. Uriah slept in the doorway with the servants. And David killed him. And Nathan the prophet came into David. He said, David, I got a problem. There's this guy that had a, a, a sheep and, uh, you know, a neighbor came and, you know, to him and uh, I mean he he needed to you know he needed to fix a meal and uh, so he took his the neighbor's sheep and uh, it was like a pet to them it was, I mean he was slept in bed with little kids I mean they had fun time with that little lamb and he killed him and ate him and uh, David said the man shall die and Nathan the prophet turned to him and said 
Thou art the man. And in a flash of blinding light, David understood that Nathan was talking about Uriah and Bathsheba. What were the first words out of David's mouth? I have sinned. Folks, we need to learn that response. When we go out face to face with our sin, we don't make excuses for it. We don't blame somebody else. We take ownership and confess it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't blame somebody else. Don't talk about how hard your life is. Don't talk about all the pressures that you've had to face. Humbly confess, I have sinned. Interesting, we see Miriam doing nothing, but Aaron intercedes for her. And Aaron says, let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of the mother's womb. Like a stillborn child, it's already started to rot. And Moses cried unto the Lord, this is his older sister. His brother has, although the brother was part of the plot of rebellion, the brother has confessed it. And so now Moses cries unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, Lord, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, Okay, just for comparison, let's compare what would have happened to her if, if some minor thing happened. The Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face. She's been a, a jerk kid, and her dad goes, spits in her face. Should she not be ashamed seven days? I mean, most girls, if their father spit in their face, especially in that Middle Eastern culture, they would have been terribly brought to shame. Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received again. Now remember, this is being done in front of the whole congregation. They're at the door of the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory moves, and you know when the Shekinah glory moved, everybody paid attention because it may mean that God is about to move the camp. So everybody's coming, getting ready to say, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And they hear God talking to Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Do you think there was some shame in that? I think so. If her father had just spit in her face, she would have been ashamed seven days. So God says, she's a leper right now. Let her learn it for a while. Let her be a leper for a week. Shut her out of the camp for seven days. And then let her come back in again. It's a good thing that both of her brothers were praying for her. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days. And the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. And afterwards, the people were moved from Hatserot and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Now, that's not the only illustration. We're going to have more illustrations, but our time is up. But the question is not all those five reasons that we often give when we are in rebellion against authority. You know, <clears throat> some leader does something that we think is stupid and culturally unaccepted. God says it doesn't matter. We outnumber him. That doesn't matter. We're older than he was. Maybe you think you're older spiritually. You may not be older physically, but older spiritually. Or you've been around longer than they have in that particular organization, in that particular church, uh, you know, in that particular work environment. And then we've suffered a lot more than you have. You got in on the cushy end of the deal. You know, those are not reasons that God accepts, although those are reasons that we often use. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the declaration that you are God, that you are the ultimate and final authority, and you choose whom you will. That's certainly true in salvation, and boy, are we thankful for that, because in your mercy you reached down and pulled us out of the, the slime and the cesspool 
and you're cleaning us off by the washing of the water of the word and the work of the Holy Spirit. And yes, we're Calvinists and we believe that God is sovereign and predestines to salvation. But then we don't think that you have enough sense to appoint the right leadership. And we gripe and complain and bellyache. And in many, 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 many different forms, we rebel. Help us to remember that what we're talking about is the rebellion of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And what you do with rebels cause us to be those who believe and who obey your word with joy because you are wise and we are not. You are God and we are not. You are omnipotent and we are not. You know the end from the beginning and we do not. And everything that you do is for our good and for your glory, for you have declared it. Father, for this we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 517, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Let's stand to sing all the verses.